to get it back to this state of Texas again. And some time ago, when I was in Waterloo, I had come in contact with Brother Lindsay that invited me down to this voice of healing convention. Later in Chattanooga, I met our dear friend, Brother David also uh, inspired me to come. And uh, to come and have a party in this convention, he has received this
Now, in the Old Testament, they had two or three ways of knowing whether it was truth or not, and that is, they would go back to what they call the Urim and Sunday. And that was, I've been told, that was the breastplate that Aaron had that had the, the twelve stones in it, and then when a prophet prophesied, or a dreamer told his dream, and, and it did not a conglomeration of light flicker on this uh, Urim and Sunday, then the prophet was wrong. See, God always had a way of answering the supernatural. See, always the truth is known. So if that was not a place, then the man, the prophet was wrong. And now, as that priesthood was done away with, and we have a new priesthood tonight, Jesus Christ being the high priest, we have a new true son, and that's the Bible. Yeah. Take away our attitude, the same shall be taken from the book of life. Amen. So we're trying our best, but God help us stay right in these pages. I often said this, I do not want any less than God has in the Bible, and I, but I want all he has oh, yeah. in the Bible, yeah. that all the promises are to us. So before we open his word for our text, let us bow our heads just a moment in prayer. Eternal and blessed God, it is such a grand privilege tonight that we have a standing in thy divine presence. Under this great tent where your children are assembled together for no other purpose but to hear the word and to see the movie of the living God. And we would ask tonight that you would pour out your blessings upon us in a a great way. Change our ways of thinking if they're wrong, God. And set our thinking on thy Son, the Lord Jesus. May our hearts be filled with his presence. And when we leave tonight from the meeting, may we say like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the road? And now, Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will just take these few words that's to be read and will pour out the context of them in every heart. Grant us, Lord, help me, Father, as I'm standing here, that my soul may rejoice in your blessed presence. For we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight, to begin my part of this convention of the speaking, I have chosen a little uh, text found over in the book of Revelation to you who mark it. Uh, Revelation, the third chapter, in the 20th verse. I wish to read this portion of the word. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and eat with me. This text of Revelation here is the message to the Laodicean church, which I truly believe that not being a dispensationalist exactly, but yet I believe that we're at the end of the Gentile dispensation. And I believe that the Laodicean Church Age was the last church age. And I think that's where we are tonight. And that's why I've taken this for a text. And some might say, well, I Brother Brand, isn't this rather a small text for a, a group of people this size and for a convention of this caliber? If you just read just a few words and one little verse of scripture. But you see, it isn't the size of the scripture, it isn't the size of the reading, it's what it is. That now. Amen. Some time ago in Louisville, Kentucky, a little friend of mine was up in the attic, an old garret in the house, and he was bumming around a little lad, and he stole into an old uh, trunk. And in this trunk, he 
found an old postage stamp just about one half inch square. And he thought maybe with the bit on his mind that ice cream might come from this stamp, so he hurries down the street to his a friend that collected his old stamp and said to this friend, I found a little old yellow stamp. It's quite old, but I just wonder if this stamp is worth anything. And the stamp collector got his glass out and looked over it a little and he quickly said, I'll give you a one dollar bill for this certain stamp. And of course the little lad not expecting more than five cents. The tale was made quickly because that dollar meant many ice cream cones. So, after a while, we, about two weeks later, this collector sold this certain set for $2,500. And about six months later, it was sold for $500,000. And you see, it wasn't the little stamp, the little piece of paper. It's what was wrote on that paper that counted. That's the way it is with my text tonight. It isn't the paper that it's wrote on. It isn't the size of the text, but it's what wrote on it. It's the Word of the living God. It's so essential to all the heavens and earth will pass away, but it shall never pass away. See, God notices every little word that we read. God knows every little thought that goes through our minds. Every little act that we do. And I'm kindly thinking this. That many times the church in its looseness gets to doing things and thinking things and, and taking things just as they are when we also weigh what we do and say. Amen. We ought to think it over before we speak it. My old southern man used to tell me, think twice and speak once. It's the little thing sometimes that we leave undone that means so much to us. We get in such a hurry to race over things in this neurotic age that we live in. It would be who about that the church of God tonight to stop and wait a minute. See where we're at. Some time ago I was standing in Vancouver, British Columbia. And the King's Guards of England had come over to visit Canada. And he was making his way down along the street in the carriage and his beautiful queen standing by him. Mr. Baxter, one of my associates, he was weeping because he said, Just think, Brother Frank, our king passes by. And I thought if that would make a Canadian weep because King George, the Honorable King, was passing by, what would it be when Jesus passes by? Oh, and the King of Kings, with his beautiful bride to church. Please. Oh. And I uh, would have still the school turned out. And the teachers give the little children a little a British flag to wave their loyalty to the king as he passed by. And as the king had went by, there was one of the certain schools as a little girl that did not return to her place. And the teacher being alarmed, she rushed out in the street to find what had become of the child. And as she looked along the street, she found the little girl standing by a telegraph pole, just weeping her little heart out. So the teacher goes over to the little girl and she says, Darling, why are you weeping so? Says, uh, did you not be able to wave your flag at the king? Yes. And she said, Yes, I, I wave my flag at the king, teacher. Well, said, did you not get... Uh, be able to holler hail to 
to the king said, Yes, I honor hail to the king's teacher. Well, said, did you not see the king? said, Yes, I saw the king's teacher. said, Well, then why are you weeping so far, darling? He said, Teacher, you see, I saw the king, but I'm so little the king didn't see me. But well, how different it is with Jesus. You don't have to be in who's who. You don't have to have your name on some great book of some sort. No matter who you are, Jesus sees you. Praise. And he knows every little act that we do. Praise. Every little thing that you do for him. Every little move that you make. He keeps it on his book. He knows all of us. Whether we are important in this world or not important, we're all important to his kingdom. Whether we are rich, poor, or indifferent. You see, this also is a pardon. A small group I read in a scripture tonight that was closed up every two days, dark in Dallas. Oh, that would put every church that's in one another's soul. Put a nice back to old fashioned fellowship oh, and a revival. Oh, 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 oh. It would do it. Some time ago in the days of our most notable Abraham Lincoln, it was told that there was a prisoner in a camp that was sentenced to death by a federal crime that he had done. <laughs> And some good man went and asked the president, won't you pardon this certain man? And the president, Lincoln, as we all know, to be a Christian. The man said, sir, do you know the man's got a mortal soul? Are you mortal soul that you are going to take from his body? And would you take his life and his begging for mercy? Mr. Lincoln fixed to get into his parish. Just wrote a little speech and said, I pardon this man, Abraham Lincoln. And the man rushed back quickly to the prison cell and said, Sir, I'll have your pardon from the President of the United States. And the man looked at him and said, Oh, if that was a real pardon, it would be on a great paper with a seal, and it would have all kinds of uh, gold letters on it if it come from the President. And he said, why do you make fun of me? And knowing that I have to be shot in the morning at sundown. He said, I'm not making fun of you, sir. This has got Abraham Lincoln's signature on it. Or he said, it isn't just enough for me to believe it. And he refused to receive it. And he was shot the next morning. Now there is a pardon at large. Told by Abraham Lincoln that this certain person was to be pardoned on this day, and a foreign squad to kill him the next day. And it was tried in federal courts, and here was the decision. A pardon is not a pardon, except it be received as a pardon. Oh, no. And this is God's word that I have just read. It's a pardon to those who want to accept it as a pardon. Amen. And it's healing to those who want to accept it as a healing. Amen. That's our Lord. And it can be any great blessing that God has promised if we re- will believe it and accept it as a pardon. Amen. Amen. No matter what size it is, what kind of a book it's wrong, mm-hmm. as long as it's God's eternal word. This is a very strange thing to see a man knocking on a door, or to be in the scriptures. I just forget the artist picture, the name of the painted the famous picture of Jesus knocking at the door. I can't call his name as a Christian artist, I believe. And when all great pictures, before they can be hung in the Hall of Fame, they have to go through the Hall of Christ first. And then, it just reminds me of the church. Before the church can ever be taken to glory, it has to go through the, this world of criticism. And sometimes we try to church, pull back from criticism. Well, that's only testing. It, it's golden nuggets to you. It's something that God has permitted to you to try you. And to bring 
you do a hundred percent pure gold. Shine. All that live body in Christ Jesus shall cover persecution. So the criticism, we welcome that. Because that's what we have to have to put us through the fiery trial. So this artist, when this picture was going through the Hall of Christ, there was one critic said, Sir, I think your portrait of Christ is beautiful. And I think standing at the door in the fire and his anticipation for watching and waiting that that one would open. But then there's one thing wrong. That is that you haven't got any rats for him to go in at. And the artist said, oh, I painted it thus. You see, in this case, the latch is on the inside. You must do the opening. Christ does the knocking. And that's the way it is with every person here tonight that's seeking God for anything. He's knocking at the door, but you have to open up. You are the one that's under control. You're on the inside to open the door. If you need salvation, if he knocks, receive it. Open the door. If you need healing, open the door. That's all you have to do. And then he will come in. That is, you'll notice the man knocking at a door is trying to gain entrance. And surely no man would knock at another man's door unless he had something important or something that he thought was important to talk over with the man. And great man has got the door down to the east. For instance, back in the days of Rome, what would have happened if the great Caesar, Augustus Caesar, would have went down to a peasant's house and would have knocked at the door? And this peasant would have come to the door. He would have seen who that great giver was. He would have fell prostrate on his face and said, Great man! Great Augustus Caesar! Come into my house. What an honor it would have been for a poor man, a peasant, that had the emperor of Rome standing at his door. That would have been a great honor. Or in the days of the late Adolf Hitler. What if Adolf Hitler would have went down to a peasant's door, a German footman's a soldier's door? And would have knocked at his door. And when this soldier opened the door and saw the great spirit of Germany at that day standing at his door, he would have come to attention and would have slew him and said, Oh, Hitler, come into my house. Anything that's in this house that you want is yours. Why? Hitler was an important man in his day especially to a German and the days that he was the dictator of Germany. Or I might say this, what if our great president Dwight Eisenhower would have come to Dallas tonight and he could have come to the house of the best Democrats there is in Dallas. It is in an honor to you. Sure, you might have disagreed with him on politics. But Dwight Eisenhower is the President of the United States. He's a great man. It's the importance of the person at the door, not in the town. Certainly. Right, yeah. And so, if he come and knocked at your door, if you would disagree with him, said, you would have said, now wait a minute, Mr. Eisenhower. You just go away from my door. I'm a Democrat. No, sir, you'd invite him in. And what would happen? Tomorrow, uh, Dwight Eisenhower would humble himself of needing to be a great president. And if he would humble himself to come to a, your door, just an ordinary man, why the, the television would pack it. All around the world, tomorrow, we'll know that Dwight Eisenhower comes to some poor man's door and Dallas, Texas. How he humbled himself to do such. Or oh, why the queen that just visits uh, here 
work in Canada, the Queen of England, and she come down into the United States, what if she would have come to one of your doors, you women here? Maybe you would have looked at her and said, I don't understand who you are. If she said, I'm the Queen of England, though you're not her subject, but yet you would have been honored to have a Queen of England at your door. Any person would, because she's an important woman. She's the greatest queen on earth, or the greatest, uh, I guess the greatest known queen on earth, is the Queen of England. Why well, you have said, come in, queen, and look over my house. And if there's anything here that you desire, you may have it. There's been a little trinket sitting on the shelf that your grandmother. What the hell has given you? And if you'd have asked for it, you'd better have it. This call was a very important. She's a great woman. It would have been an honor to surrender this little treasure to the Queen of England. Certainly, because of her important. But oh, brother, sister, Here's what I'm here to say. Who is more important to knock on your door than Jesus? Oh, and who is any more turned away than Jesus? He's turned away more than all the presidents, dictators, and kings of all the world have ever turned away. Jesus has been more turned away. The queen, the dictator, my name bringing something to you or taking something for you. But Jesus coming to your door wants to give you something, the best thing that you ever could receive. Eternal life. Oh, God. Turn from the door. Oh, God. Oh, it is a tragic thing. If a man or woman would only stop and think for just a moment, that the King of the Lord, the King of life, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. the Son of the eternal God, Lord. knocked at a mortal heart to give him something good in his turning away. Oh, Every divine promise in the Bible is yours tonight. If the faith of God knocks at your heart, then you can have it. Oh, Why would we weary? Why would we try to say, well, I'm just afraid it won't happen? How could we ever comprehend that in our mind when the King of Glory promises Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will hear me and will open the door, I'll come in and talk with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, stop in need to commune or fellowship. <laughs> Jesus wants fellowship. That's what God's heart longs for tonight. He longs for his death. And in every place in the world of breaking down the prejudice, of cleaning up from the pulpit all the way to the basement. Oh, and the Oh. 
your city and have revival and have 20,000 saved and go back six weeks later and can't find 20. <laughs> What's the matter? Here's the matter. They just get in tune with the evangelism and a big crowd of people. That's all. Amen. And the Pentecostals are getting to be the same. What we need is Christ being Lord.
counsel to you to come and buy from these fine gold things. You say that you are rich. Now, how rich is the church today? The greatest buildings it ever had, the most money it ever had? You say, I'm rich, and I have need of nothing. And you don't know that you're naked, miserable, blind, poor, and wretched, and don't know it. What is it? I am don't know it. Now, if you've seen a man coming down the street that was wretched, naked, blind, and you could run into it until you're naked, oh, I am, sir. Well, then I'll, you help me. I've got help for you here. And come in right quick. Let me call you. Well, if, if he was, if he would listen to you, all right. But what if the man's in that condition and doesn't know it? And the Bible says that this last church age would be that way. Now, you Pentecostal people, you've got the best churches you ever had. And you'd be a lot better off down on the mission, but on the street down here with a little thin, thin pan beating on the drums or something like that, calling sinners to repent and what they said the churches you got, turning into bars. You know that's right. Amen. Now, I, I don't mean to hurt your feet. I'm your brother. And I'm just telling you the truth. So, lady, that's the reason I said about you women. Making all yourself up. You Pentecost women wearing that manicure over your face, you know. Well, that's the stuff I don't want to do. You don't need that. You don't need that. That's to the devil. Let me tell you, there's only one woman in the Bible ever painted her face. And her name is Jezebel. And God fed her to the dog. So you see, a dog needs to paint her face like that. I mean that for no joke. This is not a place to joke for you. I'm just telling you the truth. It's a human trait. Now, this says that miserable, wretched, blind, and don't know it. I was raised in Kentucky in a little old clapboard shingle house, and Mama used to take all of us little brands and stick us all in one bed about three at the foot and three at the head, about three more across the middle. And she would, and we had just an old piece of canvas she would put over top of the bed to keep the snow and rain out of her eyes. And the draft would come through, and at night time when that cold wind would come through, sometimes Mama called it matter, cold, get in her eyes. And it'd stick her eyes together. And I would be older, and she'd say, Timmy, come on down. I'd say, Timmy, I can't see. My eyes are stuck together. And my little brother, Edward, he'd say, I can't see either, Mammy. You see, we caught cold in our eyes. And, and it got infection, and it stuck her eyelids together. And my grandpa was a coon hunter, and he used to catch coons, black coons, and take them out, and he would wriggle the crease out of them. And Mama would go get that old pan, set it on the stove, that coon grease. She'd get real good and hot, and come up there and massage our eyes, and, and, and after a while they'd get open. I don't know what happened, but it softened up the, the matter in her eyes, and we could see. I tell you, brother, there's been a cold spell in the church. And the Pentecostal church has got a bad cold somewhere. And it'll take more than two and three so Look around, see how good 
God did it to them. I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and open up the door, I'll come in to you with it. If the Baptist will hear it, if the Methodist will hear it, if the Pentecost will hear it, if the Nazarene, the Pilgrim Holiness, I'll come in and I'll put a little grease over your eyes and open up your eyes. So let you see where we're at. Oh, you know, the Pentecostal church has had a revival. When this little minister a while ago, the little Jewish brother here, that introduced me about spearheading a revival, we've had a wonderful revival. I don't know when ever in history there's been a revival like since this Pentecostal age. That's right, there's revival, fire is burning every nation out of heaven tonight. Right. That's right. We're in the end time. It's wonderful. And we let me say to you people here in Dallas, a headquarters of these great churches, these great people. Now don't feel bad because I say these things like I've been saying. I'm saying it for your good and for the good of the gospel, friend. Now look, then we can have real healing services. Then we can have something real take place when we break down our little walls and straighten up ourselves and wash our faces and shake ourselves. Come to and get out of the cross. Right. Then God will bless you. Amen. Then the songs of Zion will return the old fashioned blessings that we long for. God got the Pentecostal skies are full of it. Why don't you accept the substitute when the real things are at hand? No need. But you know what? That we have seen so much until we've lost the value of what we got. Amen. One time there was a man going down to the sea. He wanted a little rest. He never saw the sea. He'd been raised in more or less a desert country, and he was on his road to the sea. And he said, I'm going down. I just long to smell the salt air. And to see the great frying waves as you leap into the air and break, and the heavens blue shine down on the briny water to make man blue. Hear the wild screams of the seagulls as they circle over the sea. I long to hear it in the sea. It would be so restful for me, for I have heard that such things exist. So he made ready to go to the seashore. Just before he got to the seashore, he met an old salt returning, which means an old sailor. And he said, Where goest thou, my good man? He said, I go to the seashore, sir. He said, I go to see the great waves and explain to him. How his heart would be thrilled to only see those things. And the old salt said, Now I was born on that sea. He said, I was born in a ship. He said, I watched those waves for 40 years and heard those gulls holler. I don't see nothing exciting about it. You see, you saw it so much so they couldn't come. That's the way it was divine healing. Someone told me a little preacher prayed for a little girl here yesterday and two or three inches threw it onto her leg. By God. Mercy, that ought to set this place on fire. Amen. Sure it ought to. The king is here, the great mighty Christ of God who ruled the heavens and earth is in presence and says, Do great and mighty things to do just for you. Amen. Don't you believe it?
And so this old colored preacher take an old game hunting with him many times and they go out and hunt. So one day they've been hunting and on the road back, old both of them had rabbits and birds that hanged over until he couldn't even walk or they just so loaded down. They were coming along a certain old familiar path. And as they walked along this path, the parson kept looking back towards the west as the sun was setting. Brother, I'm telling you, the church ought to know that it's sun setting. The sun's going down. What's these blessings that we see? What did the prophet say? It'll be light in the evening time. What kind of light? How does the sun travel? He gradually rises in the east and sets in the west. Right. And civilization rolls in the east and travels westward. The east and west have met together. I'll preach on that this week, the Lord willing. Now, notice, at the same light when the sun comes up and shines on the east, the same sun shines in the west. You get it? The Bible says, or the prophet said, there will be a day that would be day or night, a dismal time. Just a dismal time. We've had enough light to join churches, and build an organization, and find right. churches. We've had that for 2,000 years. But God promised in the evening time it would be light. Oh. And what is it? The same light that fell on the audience. The same Holy Ghost that fell on Pentecost. Bringing the same result. It's falling on the Western people today. Bringing the same result that it brought back there. Hallelujah. It'll be light. And as he was looking towards the West, the old darky walking along there, he tucked the parts on the shoulder. The preacher looked around and he seen the old Gabe. And the tears were running down his cheeks. And he said, Parson, the day is Saturday. And tomorrow morning is going to find me at the motor then. And I'm going to get me a seat on the side of my dear wife back there in that church. Then I'll remain faithful till God takes my life. The parson was so happy to hear that. He said, Gabe, you know that I appreciate that. How love to hear you say that to me. But for what? Cause of sudden change. Was it the sermon I preached? Was it the things that I talked to you about the goodness of the Lord? He said, No, Parson. Coming right around, around that big down now, I felt something knock at my heart. He said, You know, Parson, I, I couldn't hit a barn. He said, I'm the poorest shot in the country. And that's the book hanging on me of the rabbits and birds that I got myself. He said he must love me or he wouldn't have given to me. A little simple thing like that can a knock of Christ at the heart. Gabe, I was on your gun sight today. What about you tonight? What about you that drove up nice cars? What about you that go to fine churches? What about you that set in your good health, not like that little child? Laying there twisting around on a cop. What about you, young lady, that said you're in good health? The little, little sick girl in the building there, little spastic little child on the girl. Don't you know that God got it on your heart to say it's good to see you? This is goodness. If we took Sunday dinner yesterday, I stood a few months ago in Bombay, India. While well, I was preaching to nearly half a million souls, and seeing that little mother just a little baby, and a little baby swelled out, dying with hunger. The church guarded, did you race out on the can to see them? Amen. Did you know that God knocking at your heart? And here you are, you said, well, I thought the church would have been prejudice, indifference, the doors closed. Oh, if this entire group of about a thousand people here tonight, for maybe not so many, if you would open every door in your heart to Jesus Christ tonight, there would be a revival of great churches that tonight, that would set newspaper headlines, and the light would come. He wants that. That's God's desire tonight about everything is to have his church won. Fine ministers, fine clothes, fine cars, fine jobs. No wonderful 
Oh, Christ! Setting it to over. Why don't you let him in? Let him come in. Let him start it. Oh, God. Oh, let every eye be closed, if you will. I just wonder, just before we pass red, if there's some in here would raise your hand and say, Brother Brown, I raise my hand to you. I'm ready to thank God because I, I felt that somewhere along the last few days I've heard a little knocking on my door. I haven't lived the life that it should, Brother Van. I've been prejudiced. I'm a church member. I, I should have done better. I know I should. I've busted my neighbors. I've argued with different churches about their doctrine. I've, I've stole it. I've, I've not lived the way I should. I, I know I shouldn't have done the things that I've done, but thank God's grace, I'm going to let the doors open tonight. I'm going to let him be my Lord from this hour on, and I'm going to mean this, Brother Brown. I'm not raising my hand to you. I'm raising my hand to Christ. I will come, Lord. Let me remember you in prayer. Quietly now, while everybody's in prayer, would you just raise your hands all over the building?